Hello, sorry for all the to-do getting set up. Unfortunately, you know, a uh, video is hard. Uh, this is a talk called Rewrites in Real Life. Um, just to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Camille. I like to have a weird gif of myself for some reason, because I think this is a cool gif and I have it. Um, I am actually currently at a company called Two Sigma, which is a financial company in New York City. Um, and I just joined them just a couple of months ago, so I'm very excited to have started that. But before I joined Two Sigma for a long time, I was a software developer, like many of you. Um, and then I went to work for a startup called Rent the Runway. I joined Rent the Runway as the director of infrastructure engineering, so I was writing a lot of code and managing a small team. And I ended up, over the four years I was there, going from software developer all the way to manager, uh, CTO, I should say. So I wrote a book called The Manager's Path. This is not a management talk, don't worry. Um, but if you are interested in technical leadership, if you are a tech lead, if you are a budding engineering manager, uh, feel free to check out my book. It's available on O'Reilly. You can find it on Amazon, O'Reilly, wherever you like. And with that, so um, failure. Failure is, the, is a very common experience in most startups in the early days, right? Even if the startup succeeds, uh, most startups start with some kind of scrappy little thing just to get things going, right? You're prototyping, you're using Ruby on Rails, you're using some kind of ugly Drupal PHP framework, for example. And if you're lucky, you actually get to the point where that scrappy little software that you threw together to hopefully attract some people to use it turns out to be wildly successful. People want to use it, they want to use your product. And then you hit problems. You have problems of scaling. You can't grow. You can't support the growth of the business. You can't support the customers. You can't support your software engineers. They're dying. They're drowning in a sea of alerts and bugs and other kinds of issues. Uh, this is certainly the experience that I had when I joined Rent the Runway. This is pretty well known. We did a big rewrite um, off of a Drupal PHP system, and that was what I was hired to do. We're in this Drupal PHP old school world. It helped us get to sort of escape velocity for this company, but we're failing. We can't add new features. Our customers can't really use our website very easily. Our team is drowning in these alerts. It's a train wreck. Everything is not fine. So, what is the solution that we pretty much always reach for in this case? Well, we think, aha, I'm going to rewrite everything, and it's going to solve all of my problems. The rewrite is going to get me out of this mess that I'm in. We're going to go from this old you know, combustion engine ugly train to this beautiful new bullet train. It's going to be amazing, and it's going to make our lives so much better. Well. I saw a talk a few years ago by my friend Cliff Moon. Cliff has been the CTO, VP of engineering, founder of a bunch of different companies in the tech space. Um, and he gave a talk, and part of his talk, he said, there's no such thing as a successful rewrite. The sustainable rewrite looks like firefighting. And I thought, yes, this is a man who knows what he's talking about. Unfortunately, while we all love the idea of rewriting our software, in fact, it's very hard to be successful. So we're going to talk about what you might need to do to give a successful rewrite. Uh, we're going to talk about the dangers of rewriting, why you might fail. We're going to talk about the principles for success, and we're going to talk about what happens if you actually manage to succeed and pull this off. What happens next? So let's go again. The path to rewriting is fraught with danger. There are so many different ways to fail in a rewrite, and you need to be aware of all these different cases of failure uh, if you're going to do it successfully. The first thing is, of course, that usually, if you are rewriting a system, you are already failing. You are in the midst of failure right now, or you can see failure coming quickly at you. You know that you can't meet the needs of your customers. You know that you can't scale. You can't scale, right? Very, very common failure. This is the Twitter fail whale. Uh, for those of you who you know, have been around tech for more than a few years, you probably remember the days of the Twitter fail whale, where back in 2008, 2009, 2010, before Twitter really got their engineering act together in order to handle the volume of people that they had there, they had a lot of challenges scaling. They built this cool little Ruby on Rails application, and millions of people wanted to use it. And millions of people did use it, or tried to use it, and they had a really hard time scaling. So they did, famously, a big rewrite 
out of that Ruby on Rails application into microservices. And that was a big way that they managed to save their business by getting over their scaling problems, right? So scaling is a huge driver of many rewrites. When I joined uh, Rent the Runway in 2011, we actually had this system where we had Drupal PHP. We were using an old version of Drupal, so clients, if you logged into the website, you had a sticky session to an actual web server. It meant that we couldn't scale out web servers on demand, so if we had a lot of people wanting to use the website, we'd have to plan ahead for that and have enough hardware available and allocated all the time to meet even what our peak demand might be, right? Not a great model, even in 2011. Speaking of not being able to meet customer, not being able to scale, right? Not being able to meet customer demand is kind of a version of scaling, right? Certainly, if your website is crashing all the time, you can't meet customer demand. But it's more than that. You can imagine the case, for example, where you have written some software as a service, and it's awesome, except that all of the clients that want to pay you for your software want to run it on premises. They want to run it in their data centers. They want to run it on their machines. They're not willing to run it as a service. Perhaps you're trying to sell to the financial services industry. You might need to do a rewrite in order to meet your customer demand. If you don't have the ability, say, in a commerce site, to actually get people in front of your products because you're not accurately representing your inventory, maybe you're overly cautious, overly conservative, and showing people what's available, you may need to rewrite to make that model better. Okay, and last but not least, the technical debt. You're crushed under the weight of technical debt. Your team is getting so many alerts. Your team is dealing with so many bugs and so many fires and so many incidents and so many outages that they just can't get anything done. Now, this is a great reason to rewrite, but I caution you that developers often view technical debt as any code that they didn't write themselves or that was written more than six months ago. Uh, that's certainly my kind of experience personally, and that was certainly what I've observed, right? So you've got to be careful that the rewrite for technical debt reasons isn't just, I don't like this, I don't like, you know, ugh, we're using PHP, and PHP is so ugly, and I'd really rather be using Haskell. Those are not great reasons to do a rewrite. Really want, you know, actual, serious, hard to support, hard to maintain, hard to evolve software. That's a strong reason for a technical debt rewrite. Not liking some of the choices that prior authors made is not always a great reason to do it. Okay, so you're probably failing in some ways if you're contemplating doing this at all. Um, it's also very easy to fail because there are so many unknowns, right? You're probably pretty busy trying to deal with maintaining the system that you have at all. How much time do you really have to uncover all the unknowns that will make a rewrite successful? How well do you know what the system is doing right now? Software systems that run in production for any period of time develop what's called production hardening. That's all those little tweaks and fixes that you've put into place, right? Oh yeah, that, oh, that's a really interesting weird edge case. Let me just like put a little hack in and fix that. All those things that you didn't document, that you just kind of threw together and threw up there that make the system stable, all those things that your customers and users expect from the system, whether or not they're great, they kind of know how the software works. We all get upset when somebody changes our favorite interface, right? All of these little things make it really, really hard to rewrite software. It's hard to know all of the edge cases because they almost certainly are not documented. Um, I have been in the situation where we said, oh, we're going to rewrite the system, and we're going to do a hack day, actually a couple of hack days, to see how much of the system we can get rewritten. And it was like, oh, awesome. We like, went to this new language, and we rewrote like, you know, all these major workflows in the system in two days. And you look at it, and you're like, that's, that's great. But we've written like, the really easy to understand common hot workflows. And that's useful, but of course, it's all the myriad of edge cases that's going to kill us. What about the admin tools, right? What about, you know, oh, yes, we've got to do taxes and promotions. We've got to do what happens when things fail? What happens when the systems fail? How do we handle all those kinds of edge cases, right? It's very, very hard to know all of the different things that a production system is actually doing. What about the data, by the way? Data is really hard to handle in a rewrite. Even if you're keeping the data structures the same, but you're moving to a new data store, you've got to figure out 
How do I know that I'm writing all the data, that I'm not missing anything? Right? If you cho choose to change your data structures, if you choose to change your data models, which you may very well want to do, I really want to go from a relational model to, say, a document store, Okay, that would be cool, right? That makes sense for what we're doing. Well, you're changing the whole structure of the data. How are you going to make sure that you're writing the right data place? Are you doing backfills? Are you doing, you know, are you doing the reconciliation that you need, right? How do you know that you're doing the right thing there? And finally, of course, how does the team need to change to make this successful? Uh, your team that you have right now is probably the team that created the old system, some of them at least. Uh, and they don't necessarily have all the skills that they need to go to the new system that you want to go to. Maybe they need to learn new languages or new frameworks. Maybe they're not really distributed systems experts, and you need to go from that big old monolithic system to a series of microservices. And now you actually need some expertise, some people that actually understand how to develop distributed systems. So you're going to have to spend some time retraining your team. Last but not least, there are many temptations that can happen in a rewrite that will make you more likely to fail, such as trying to do too much. Uh, it's very tempting to say, oh, we're going to move this data, and we're going to restructure this data, and we're going to move all the code that calls the data. Uh, all at the same time, right? We're, gonna, we're just going to get this done. We did this, uh, one of the first pieces of the rewrite that we did at Rent the Runway involved moving some data to a new structure that was more efficient, better for the business, and moving the logic. Um, and it was a good idea. It was really good for the business. It ultimately was a very necessary project. But the thing is that it was pitched as a six-week project for a couple of developers. A couple of developers, six weeks, no big deal. Five months later, almost the whole team and a death march, it finally got finished. It finally got finished because we decided to not only rewrite all of the logic into a service in a new language, but we were also changing the entire data model out from under it. So when you had a bug, the question is, is it in the old code calling the new code? Is it in the new code? Is it in the new data model? Are we missing something? What have we not thought about? That's a really complex way to have to figure a system out. And it probably made that project significantly more complicated. The uh, ultimate version of this, of course, is the Big Bang release. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go off there, and we're going to rewrite the whole thing from scratch. And then we're going to flip a switch, and that's going to be our new system. It'll be awesome. And it is surprising. You may think, this is silly. Who would do this? This is a very common thing that people say. You know what? Let's not worry about you know, how we're going like, to actually stage this work. We're just going to do it over here, and we'll figure it out, and we'll get it done, and we'll just flip that switch, flip that switch and it'll all be done. This is, inc drastically increases the likelihood of failing at the end, letting you be a little lazy up front. Uh, finally, and this is an odd one. I, don't, I try not to be too prescriptive about technologies and softwares, but you should be wise about what kinds of software you choose, what kinds of systems and frameworks and languages you choose when doing a rewrite. The languages and frameworks and tools that you use get the same production hardening value that your software gets by having more users, more people using it, more time in production, they accumulate all those fixes, all that knowledge, all that stuff in Stack Overflow that you can Google so you can actually just figure out how to get something done and get it done, right? All of that stuff is going in not only, it's not probably hopefully not going into your software unless you're you know, supporting some public project, but all that production hardening applies to your tools and languages as well. And so if you choose your tools, to do something hot and new, because oftentimes we're rewriting out of like old crufty systems. We're like, ugh, we're so sick of Java. Ugh, let's do something cool. Let's do Clojure. Let's do Haskell. Let's do Rust. You know, none of which are bad languages, right? But they're very, very new, and they have a little bit less potentially. Potentially, not that any of those is a good example, but a bit less of that production hardening on them, right? Uh, it's very tempting to choose the software that will attract new talent to your team that people are excited about, especially if you're at a startup and you're thinking about recruiting. Oh, I want to put some energy, and we're all excited about learning this new thing. But choosing the wrong software can take your life away. We actually did this. We chose a new hot framework when I was a uh, uh, working on this rewrite that was a Java framework that was a little bit like Ruby on Rails for Java. Turns out that's not a good model for Java. But it was fun. It was fun to prototype in. Uh, 
it's not a good model for Java so far that, in fact, all the people who were writing that framework moved on to something new. They actually wrote a V2 of the framework that was very different because we all kind of realized that this was a bad idea. But now, our new code, our fancy new rewrite, immediately had a couple of services that were already legacy about six months after they had been written. So choose wisely. OK, so enough failure. How do we be successful? Because in reality, as engineers, we will almost certainly all do a rewrite at least once, if not several times in our careers. I've done a few already. I'm overseeing at least a couple in my current job. So this is a very common thing that you're going to do. So what are the principles you should do to make it successful? Well, let's start with change as little as possible. This is firefighting. Firefighting involves uh, you know, sort of taking stock of the problem and extinguishing the worst parts of the fire or the most meaningful parts of the fire as quickly as you can. Don't rewrite everything. Consider this. Can you modify in place instead of rewriting everything? One of my most successful quote unquote rewrites was uh, a distributed system that I built. It actually was a big singleton, Java singleton caching system that served various web pages. And we rewrote that system to be a distributed system. And there was a lot of pressure to say, oh, let's completely rewrite it. Let's write it in C++. Let's you know, do this, that, and the other. We were actually able to just modify the existing system while work was being done on it and move it to be a distributed system because that system had actually been pretty well developed, pretty well designed. It had a lot of feature flags and testing. And that meant that the developers who were not working on this distribution project were still able to get their work done and move forward. And we were able to change the system pretty significantly without like rewriting the whole world. Now, this is, of course, not always possible. We were very lucky to be able to do that. But even when you do need to do a full rewrite and move into a new language or new systems, taking some time to stabilize the system that you have is a really good idea. So don't just neglect the old system because you're rewriting to a new system. If you've got big issues, taking some time to do some analysis. Where are our big pain points? Where are our big you know, failure edges or our database queries that are really slow, right? Taking some time to improve that system a little bit can buy you a lot of runway to make the project more successful. Second, you can rewrite, but keep the language the same. So why do you have to change everything? Maybe you just need a better framework, right? Maybe the framework that you're using is just not great for what you're trying to do. Maybe you're using something that's really uh, opinionated framework that doesn't really work all that well for what you're trying to do. So you should get out of this opinionated framework to something that's a little bit more flexible. But you can save all the knowledge that your team already has in the language, and you can save possibly even some of the logic. OK. Um, a lot of the time, neither of those is really possible. Uh, and so you've got to figure out how you're going to decompose the system so that you can change one thing at a time. If you are rewriting a big monolith into microservices, this is what you are doing. In my opinion, this is actually why microservices are such a popular model right now, because so many of us had these monoliths that we threw together, and we realized that we really just couldn't easily scale them as they were. So we had to do something. And if you think about how to decompose the pieces of the system, you start to identify natural service boundaries. Rewrite into those services, redirect the code, reroute the code, and voila. Great, you're doing your rewrite, you're getting it done. The nice thing about this is that you can actually start to add new features in between pieces of your rewrite. And if you are trying to keep your business side, your product people happy, you probably want to be able to add new features as you go along. This is one of the most, I would say, critical pieces to success, is figuring out how to decompose the system and do it in pieces. OK, you need to sell it. If you don't do this well, especially if you are the leader of a team, this is, can be a career-ending, <laughs> not a career-ending, but a job-ending problem for you. Right? I know plenty of leaders at startups who have gotten fired because they chose to do a rewrite that really didn't go well, and it dragged on for 18 months, two years, and their CEOs got sick of them. So be careful. Start by selling it to yourself, and if you have a technical boss, selling it to them. Talk to your skeptical friends. Talk to the skeptical people around you. Ask them, what do you think about this thing I'm thinking of doing? Does this sound like a good idea? What do you think the problems with my plan are? Do you buy that I actually need to rewrite this? Or do you think that maybe that's not a great idea? 
do you really know the system well enough to make a plan for it that you could tell if you have a technical boss, you could explain to them how you've broken it down and how you're going to go about this rewrite? Because your boss may have your back, but it's really in your best interest to not only make sure that they have your back, but that they really, really get it, that they really get what you're going after with this. Sell it to your partners, the business, the people who are using your software, whether it's internally or externally, with big, scary graphs. What is the big thing that you're trying to solve for here? Maybe you have infrastructure costs that are uncontained because your system doesn't scale well. Maybe you can't add new developers to your team or you can't get new features out. So you've got this sort of flat line of features, right? One, there is probably some one or two major metrics that you can put on a graph that look pretty scary to people that will help them understand, oh, this, this is the burning need, right? This incident count that just keeps going up. This amount of time that my developers have to actually work on features or the amount of time it takes to get a feature done. These are powerful metrics to sell why you need to do this project. Okay, and last but not least, sell it to your team. Your team may seem like they're excited to do this, but don't underestimate how valuable it is to really make sure they're fully on board. They are the people that are gonna spend a couple of years of their lives working on this rewrite for you, right? Because most rewrites take 18 months, two years. They're not fast projects. So make sure that your team is bought in. As possible, give them options. Let them select some of the technologies that you're gonna be rewriting into if you're gonna do that, right? Get, them, get their full buy-in because you are gonna need it if you're gonna survive this project. Finally, you need a detailed definition of done. How do you know when you're gonna declare a victory? Um, something I would hope would be obvious is a test suite that acts as a safety harness. So, you know, just as to do good refactoring, you kind of do need unit tests. If you don't have unit tests and you try to refactor, you tend to break things. This is part of why unit testing is so popular amongst people who are really into kind of refactoring stuff. Um, similarly, if you're trying to do a big system rewrite and you have no high-level system-wide tests, it's pretty hard to know when you're breaking something. So if you've got a system where you're rewriting, let's say, the backend logic, you're keeping the interface the same to begin with, which is my advice, uh, you can have smoke tests that go against the old interface and exercise a lot of the functionality. And as you move logic around on the back end, you can tell, hey, am I breaking things? Am I not breaking things? This is going to help you know how far you've gotten and whether you're doing the right thing. Those big scary graphs that I mentioned are the, uh, those big scary graphs that I mentioned are very useful for knowing what it is you're actually looking to improve. So, you promised people that you would be reducing the number of incidents. Are you actually tracking that? You promised people that you would be making features able to be uh, developed faster. Are you tracking that? Are you tracking your infrastructure costs? Try to measure that thing that you said you were going to be able to improve with this rewrite and try to figure out something that you can actually see incremental improvement on. Again, not just the thing that once the whole system is rewritten, oh, everything will be much better, right? There has to be some incremental intermediate stages of improvement to show. Data, data, data. I don't even have images for data because it's so complicated that you can't possibly capture it in an image. Do you have a data migration plan? If you are planning on rewriting your data or even just storing it in a different data store, you need a plan around that. Are you going to do dual writing? Are you going to do a reconciliation? How are you going to backfill the new data? Have you thought about that? You have analysts somewhere, probably, that rely on the data exactly as it exists right now, and they have the worst SQL queries that you are going to have to figure out how to help migrate to the new system. Don't forget about the data. Don't underplan for data migration. And then celebrate. Hooray! Hooray, we're done. Don't just celebrate at the end, though. Celebrate all of your major milestones. You're, again, this is a long process. Celebrate your major milestones in public so that everybody else around you knows, hey, we're getting things done. You may not see it. You may just hear like, oh, service foo got launched. That's great. But when you celebrate it sort of publicly and you make it known to people, hey, guess what? We're really excited. Service foo got done. And that means that X, Y, and Z is possible. And that means that this graph has moved. That's awesome. So your team needs those regular celebrations, and it actually helps everybody else around you know we are getting things done. We're not just over here in a corner, you know, spinning our wheels. 
OK, so you've done a successful rewrite. It's awesome. What does the outcome actually look like? Well, one thing that people don't really think about a lot with these things is that they actually tend to cause cultural changes. Code and people and processes all kind of intermingle in companies. It's not just one thing standing alone. And so when you change the code and the systems, your culture tends to have some impacts as well, such as all those people who wrote the original system often feel a bit threatened. I don't know the system, the news language as well. I can't do things the way I used to do things. I used to be the top dog around here. Everybody looked to me to answer everything because I knew where all the bodies were buried. And now with the new system, I'm not the expert anymore, or I'm one of many experts. People can feel threatened when they see a company changing, when they see technology changing, and they have to learn new stuff in order to change with it. Not everybody finds that to be something they want to do. Your workflows also have to change. So the way you did work in the past is probably going to change when you change your systems. Uh, especially if the way you did work in the past was that the co-founder came and stood behind someone and tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey, can you just like implement this thing or make this change? And the developer kind of you know, typed for a while and then, voila, look, cool, the change is there on the website. Well, that's great when you're in a kind of you know, fast, for, uh, fast for prototyping system. But unfortunately, that system is not scaling for you, most likely. right? That system has some scaling issues. So now you've got something where, actually, to make a little change, you kind of need to talk to the product manager, or you need to talk to someone else who's going to coordinate the work that will get that done. That's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, anyone who's ever been tapped on the shoulder by a co-founder knows that that's not always the most pleasant thing to happen. Uh, but your workflows start to change. You start to often add a little bit more process as you do this evolution. Uh, hand in hand with that, of course, is that the structure of your team changes from a flat structure of uh, sort of full stack engineers often, where everybody knows everything, to something that's a little bit more siloed, potentially. You've got specialists out there. You've got you know, your ops specialists or your front end specialists. This doesn't have to happen, but it does tend to happen as you do a rewrite, especially if your rewrite's goal is to scale things, right? If you really want to scale a team, scale systems, you often end up with specialists specialist roles and silos. And that can be good, but it definitely causes you know, unexpected consequences. A new architecture brings new challenges. Surprise, surprise. Uh, it's tempting to make that V2 everything you ever wanted. Uh, very, very tempting. They even call it, it's so tempting it has a name for it. They call it second system effect, second system effect. Um, and it's a well-documented thing that happens where you, know, you have this old system, and you wrote it, and it's popular, people use it. But you look at it, and you're like, gosh, well, if I had just done x, y, and z, and a, b, and c, it would be so much better. It'd be so awesome. And so you go off, and you say, OK, we're going to write v2. And v2 has to have all of the mistakes you made in v1 corrected. What tends to happen is that you overcorrect. And sometimes you just never get it done. And other times, you just end up building something that's way too complicated, hard to operate, or just over-engineered. Uh, you can't boil the ocean, but you can cause global warming. We over-engineered for failure tolerance when I uh, did my big rewrite at the runway. So we, we thought that we wanted to make everything super, super failure tolerant. We wanted to have these really individual um, uh, failure zones, right? So any particular piece of the system being down would just mean that like a slice of the system was down. But you know what? To do that well requires a ton of overhead in terms of number of operations that you need to be worrying about, number of systems you actually need to have running to make that work. We were really not prepared for that. And that over-engineering cost us a lot of energy and ultimately didn't really work that well. In fact, it affected our process. So over-engineering can happen to the systems, it can also happen to the process. Everyone you know, who heard, oh, well, now instead of asking an engineer directly to do something, you go to the product manager, has probably rolled their eyes and thought, oh, god, now we've got this agile process where like, the ticket goes from here to there, and this person looks at this ticket, and this person does that one. You can definitely over-engineer process when a lack of process has been causing you problems. Uh, we over-engineered various parts of our process, um, one of which was actually our deployment process, because we had to do all this complex stuff for those swim lanes I was telling you about. So we had these git submodules, and we had all these different clouds that we were trying to cross-deploy to. And 
there you would have to sort of merge these, get submodules into all these different code bases in order to do a deploy. And frankly, it just didn't make any sense. And it was really complicated. It took like four hours to deploy the website. That was not very good. We over-engineered the hell out of both the uh, software and the process along these axes. And we had to pull all of that out because that was just a, a mistake, right? And of course, you're never really done. The tire fire is always burning a little bit somewhere. There's always something that you want to rewrite. And frankly, there's always some piece of your system that's not quite where you would like it to be, that alerts too often, that's a little bit too slow. It's the system that, ca that causes problems for you, that you want to fix. Uh, we declared done, I declared done in, the, in my big rewrite when all of the customer-facing functionality had been moved out of the old system and into the new system. But that didn't mean we didn't have stuff in the old system. We actually had a bunch of administrative pages. So when do you decide to put your effort on those lightly used pieces of the system that you know you don't really see a lot of business value in rewriting? How do you decide when to make that call? And then, of course, you've got the new stuff that you wrote that it turns out was legacy three months after you wrote it. And now people want to rewrite that. You're never quite done with these things. Hopefully, though, if you're successful, you create a system that will outlast its predecessor in some degree, right? Maybe it's not going to last twice as long, but hopefully it will last longer than the predecessor did. Um, and you do this by thinking about the flexibility that you want to put in, right? Probably you're rewriting because you're missing some kind of flexibility, particularly if you're rewriting in order to be able to add a lot of new features to move faster, right? So you think, oh, okay, well, we need to be a lot more flexible. We need to be flexible to scale more, to have more independent scaling domains, perhaps. We need to be more flexible to add new kinds of features, to add new kinds of development flows, um, to support different kinds of use cases. That's all great. Unfortunately, if you don't really know the kind of flexibility that you're aiming for, you can cause yourself a lot of problems. It's very tempting in a rewrite to say, oh, well, my old system was slow. And so I need to write my new system with performance as my number one, uh, number one priority. Right, so you get into this optimization corner where you trade off readability and possibly even flexibility for this performance and, performance and efficiency side of things. Right? So you're like, oh, well, instead of having indirect, message, uh, indirect uh, uh, network calls because like, that's really slow, we shouldn't have any intermediary services. The website should just talk directly to every service that it needs. Well, that is faster than having an ne extra network hop to talk to a couple of different services. Unfortunately, it means that every time you want to change anything about the look and feel of the website, you're making a bunch of different calls to a bunch of different systems. And that's not really very uh, easy for many developers to understand. So you actually make it harder for people to read and understand the code. So if you want to put flexibility in there, you've got to think about the standards that you want to put in place to mitigate that complexity. Um, this is a big mistake that I made and that I would hopefully not make again in the past, right? API standards, monitoring standards, operational standards, how do you deploy things? Standardizing earlier on those things, especially if you're going to a services model, is a really important thing to do because otherwise everyone has to decide every time they make something new, how do we do this again? What's the way we should do this? How, what's the best practice here? And you've got tons of different variants of systems now running around. So thinking about the standards you want to put in place to mitigate the cost of that flexibility is going to be an important aspect of a successful rewrite. OK, last but not least, build with the needs of a larger or smaller team in mind. If you are building, many of us are doing rewrites because we want to support a larger engineering team. And that's great. And so you, you know, the idea is, look, this should be faster for people to onboard onto. They should be able to do more. We should be able to have more people working on things at once. Great. But if you're building with the idea that you're going to have a much smaller team working, well, then you better be careful, right? Are you building a system with a bunch of moving pieces with the idea that once you're done, fewer people will be able to support it? Because that doesn't really often work out that, that well, right? If you are simplifying the number of moving pieces, you might be able to have fewer people support it. But if you're actually adding moving pieces with the idea of supporting with a smaller team, that's a little bit of a uh, questionable decision. So to summarize, you're in a train wreck. Things are going poorly. Everything is not fine. And so you believe that it is time to do a rewrite. All right, what do you do? The factors of successful rewrites. Be aware of the dangers that come with a rewrite. Right? Be aware of the fact that you're failing, the different ways that you can fail. 
Uh, be aware of the shortcuts you're going to be tempted to make and the things that you don't know. If you want to be successful, sell it. Make sure to spend some time selling it. Think about how you can change as little as possible and know what done looks like. Have a plan. And finally, what are the outcomes? Things change. Things change in somewhat unpredictable ways. Your culture changes, your process changes. Hopefully you've got a more flexible system, but you're really never done. So it's hard to say what things are gonna look like when all is said and done. But ultimately, you prepare for a brave new world, and if you're very good and very lucky, you will have created a sustainable future. And with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. A very interesting presentation. Um, any questions? Hello. So uh, the premise of, of this talk seemed to be that you that you are failing, and everyone agrees that you are failing. Is there any way to sort of nip it in the bud, and um, maybe? do some rewriting before, like you are actually succeeding, Yeah. but you see troubles in the future, but it's kind of hard to make that argument to people that actually sell your software because they have a hard time seeing the value of a rewrite because there is no value for the customer right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, I think that's part of why so often rewrites don't happen until you're failing. It's very hard to make the case that if we build this, you know, if we take this system that we've got now, which is working fine, and we can see some problems with it, but ultimately it's meeting our demand, it's scaling well enough, we can still get stuff out of it. It is a hard argument to make to say, but we should still rewrite it um, for, a, for speculative benefits in the future. Um, I think that the, uh, the ways that you can kind of mitigate that are to be creative about identifying things that you know that are going to be happening in the future that your system won't support that well. So I advise CTOs to think about how you are building for many possible futures and staying a couple of steps ahead of what might be asked of the business. So, you know, if you are like, look, we're pretty flexible in these ways, but, if, but I know that this issue is important to our business, and we really don't have any systems that can support that well. Um, making an argument to rewrite part of your system in order to be able to support that in the future is actually can be sort of useful. So it's, you know, unfortunately for most of us, we don't have the luxury of being able to say, look, you know, everything's great now, but we want to spend a lot of technical energy doing something that we don't have clear business outcomes for. That can be very difficult to do. And I think the job of a good technical leader is actually to be doing that a little bit all the time um, and encouraging your teams to be investing in the technology so that you never really need to do this gigantic big rewrite. It was a great talk, thank you. It resonates a lot with what I've seen. I'm, I'm curious uh, what you had to take is on, sometimes people are proud of what they build or their components and they rationalize, they don't want to lose it. So there is some external service that can completely remove this piece of code and make it somebody else's problem. But people that are emotionally attached to it, they, they engineers, they have all kinds of artificial arguments why we should keep it and improve it and make it better because we own it and we have a code. Yeah. I'm curious if you have this experience. Oh yeah, I mean that's, you know, we all we all fall in love with our software. I mean, even like, you know, if you've ever had someone be like, "Uh, oh, I don't like the way you wrote that that feature, so I'm going to like refactor it and clean it up." Like even that can feel threatening, right? <laughs> if it's something that you wrote that you think is actually pretty good. Um, and it can be very threatening to say like, "Hey, we wrote this software, but you know what? We could just buy this from someone else or, you know, use this cloud service and it would be much better." Um, I think that you know, one of the things to think about there is like, is this really something that provides us competitive advantage in building it and owning it ourselves? Or is this something that like is really very standard, right? So the idea these days of building your own database to, you know, solve the problems that you have, maybe if you were doing something truly out there, 
um, there's there's a case for it, right? But if you are building a pretty, you know, a business that we've all like ha that has been thought of so far, <laughs> right? And most of us are building some variant of a business that has been thought of so far. You probably don't need to also invent a database in order to make your business successful. So, uh, you know, there there are cases where it's very obvious that like this is not a competitive advantage, and we should probably buy it or use you know cloud or use open source. Uh, and there are cases where it's very obvious this is our competitive advantage and we should write it ourselves. It, there's definitely a gray area towards the middle where you don't really know how much competitive advantage is it that you can hire people who want to work on this kind of system. Even though you could probably get a good system like this you know, in the cloud, maybe you're getting advantage by having the kind of people who want to work on that on site working for your company. I don't know. That gets tricky, right? There, so, it's a, so I don't have a good, like, pat answer. I think the pat answer to that is, well, if it provides you a competitive advantage, then write it yourself. And if it doesn't, then you should, get, you should not as much as possible. Um, but I do think that, you know, one thing that I try to encourage people to do, if nothing else, is look to adopt open source, but then encourage your developers to contribute back to the projects that you're using so that they actually feel some ownership in those open source projects, and they don't feel like you're just giving away their ability to work on something interesting and fun because somebody else has done it better, but you're actually saying, like, look, you can work on something that's larger and larger scale because it's used by way more people. Um, it just, you know, but it's kind of cheaper for us because we don't have to have 20 people supporting it. We can have, like, two, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. If not yet, yeah, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks.